It all happened 14 or 15 years ago. I must have been almost 10. The place has since been renamed Greenleaf Village, but it was known as Lotus Flower Peak back then. Lotus Flower Peak was the name of a mountain visible from the south gate, where a cannon used to go off at noontime. The village, also called the Lotus Flower Peak, lay between the mountain and the city gates. Now the village is nothing but a slum where laborers live in filthy quarters. But at the time, its residents held their heads high. There were only about a dozen households in the village then, and the villagers generally made their living by either keeping an orchard, planting vegetables, or growing bean sprouts. In the village, there lived a man who owned the largest orchard and enjoyed the most comfortable lifestyle. His name I have forgotten, but the villagers called him Sir O. His face was round and handsome, and the sound of his voice rang out as loud as a cicada crying in full summer throttle from a willow tree. Being a very industrious old man, he would wake up at dawn and supervise the household chores, his hands clasped behind his back. Since he was like a clock, the villagers rose when they heard him up. If he wasn't heard chanting servants during his morning rounds, people found this so strange they would visit his house to see what was the matter. He was found to be in bed not feeling well. But such a thing happened no more than once a year, hardly once in two or three years even. Since he always wore an official skull cap, the villagers called him Yang Ban, even though he was just a newcomer. In return, he tried not to lose the goodwill of the villagers. He distributed the strings of dried pollack and bundles of labor in December and stocked up on spare farming equipment, which he lent to his neighbors for free upon request. As a result, his family came to be respected as among the most generous as well as the most influential in the village. In his household, there lived a deaf-mute servant named Sam Nyong. He was short and stocky and had hardly any neck, so that it looked as if his head were glued to his shoulders. In addition, he had a pock-marked face and a huge mouth. His master had had him cut off his wispy ponytail, after which his hair always stuck up like a chestnut burr. When he walked, he looked out of breath and sluggish, like an ugly toad standing on its hind legs. The villagers never referred to him by his name, but always called him Mute Mute or Parrot Parrot. But Sam Nyong couldn't hear any of these things anyway. His master had brought him along when the entire household first moved in. Sam Nyong was honest, loyal, hardworking, and strong. Although he was a mute who got by through reading people's faces, in circumstances he could be more sensible than those who could speak and hear. Besides, he was always cautious and never made a mistake. As soon as he got up in the morning, he swept the yard and fed the cows and pigs. During the summer, he weeded the fields and carried the firewood to be chopped. During the winter, he shoveled the snow and ran all kinds of errands. The master took good care of the mute and appreciated him above all for his diligence. If the mute looked sick, he was allowed to rest. He was given what he wanted to eat, was clothed however he needed to be, and was allowed to sleep regular hours. The master had one son, the sole higher for the third straight generation. He was 17 years old but looked more like 14. Since he had been greatly pampered during his upbringing, 
the boy ended up being ill-mannered toward everyone, behaving like a spoiled child and reacting with cruelty to people and animals alike. The villagers often cursed the boy, bastard, a son like that. He won't ever be anything but a burden to his father. Better not have a son at all. Whenever the son did something wrong, the master's wife said to her husband, Why don't you give him a good beating? How can you be so lenient? At times, she looked ready to whip the boy herself. Well, he hasn't come of age yet, the master would say. He won't be like that when he grows up a bit more. How old does he have to be? She raked his wife like a heron. He'll be twenty in no time. He'll soon be marrying and having children. If he acts like that, what on earth will he be fit for? She continued to lash out at her husband. You're the one who spoiled him. All you ever do is pamper him. You'll never teach him manners. When she started in on him like this, the master would quietly walk away. The son did not regard the mute as a human being. Counting on the poor servant's inability to speak, the boy, on his way in or out, would punch the mute in the side or kick him front behind. But at such times, the mute simply considered the youth rather endearing. He was even amused at the small helpless limbs poking at his iron body. So he would just turn away, move to different place, and forget one matter. Once the son put dung into the mute's mouth while the latter was taking a nap. Another time, the boy stealthily tied up the mute's arms and legs, lit matches between all his fingers and toes, and watched in glee as the mute, taken by surprise, leapt up and writhed in pain as if about to perish. On such occasions, the mute's heart was filled with indignation, but he resented his own deformity rather than his mustard son. He'd cursed the world but not the boy. The mute never shed a tear. He didn't have any tears. His eyes were like a dried-out fountain, ready to flow but never flowing. Like a dog that never abandons its master, the mute believed that he could not live anywhere but in his old master's house, and that he could trust no one except the people who resided there. He figured that it was simply his fate to live and die in that house. All the abuse he received from his master's son, the pinching, punching, and kicking, he regarded as merely inherent to his place in the world. The pain he suffered was what fate held in store for him, the bitterness of pain no more than what he deserved. He never thought of avoiding his due. Although he never considered leaving the house or breaking free from his circumstances, he did think of his powerful fists whenever his master's son pestered and mistreated him. He knew that he was strong enough to restrain the sun. At times, when he was immersed in pain and bitterness, the mute could feel his fists start to tremble. He would be tempted to strike his young master, but he suppressed this impulse along with his terrible pain. No, he is the son of my master. He repeated to himself, He is my young master. He would forget soon enough. When the boy came home later in tears after playing with other children in the village, the mute would go fight for him like a bull on a wild rampage. No troublemaker in the village dared challenge the master's son for fear of the mute. And the boy, in turn, always sought out the mute whenever he was in trouble. Like a faithful dog that crawls back after a beating, the mute did all he could without reservation for the sake of his master's son. 
Little is to say, the mute, despite his 23 years, had never had any opportunity to become acquainted with the fairer sex. He would experience a languid pleasure mingled with anger and irritation when the village girls mocked him, shouting, Mute! Mute! and making strange gestures with their hands and bodies. But he had never felt love for a woman. Since the mute was a man and therefore experienced desire, his blood did not simply run cold. In fact, his blood may well have been hotter than others, but simply hardened like toffee that curdled at high heat. With added heat or sunshine, his blood might just have boiled over. It was not that he did not let the odd sigh escape late into the night, as he wove straw shoes under a flickering oil lamp. Rather, he'd given up any hope of satisfying his bodily desire so long ago that he could readily suppress it now. Hidden deep in his heart, there lay simmering passion like a dormant volcano, the eruption of which none could foretell. The time for that had yet to come. Although the mute himself could feel his desire smolder within, threatening to explode, no occasion for release had presented itself. Indeed, external circumstances had suppressed his desire for so long that it seemed unlikely to manifest itself of its own accord. For in his repressed condition, he had developed a fortified self-control and an ever-vigilant resignation. I'm a mute. He felt deep resentment at this thought, but at the same time he believed that he wasn't entitled to the same rights and freedoms as others. When he followed this line of reasoning, his self-resignation, the growth of which he could not have prevented, even had he wanted, continued to deepen so that by now, like a machine, he took his slavery in his master's house as the hand of fate, believing that there was no other life for him. It all happened in the autumn of that year. The master's son had just been married. The bride was 19, two years older than the bridegroom. The master had always been resentful of his family's low status and had coveted, more than anything else, a daughter-in-law with a noble lineage. But noble families do not let go of their daughters so easily. As a result, he had all but bought the daughter of certain fallen aristocrat from a southern village. He cajoled the aristocrat's widow and to give up her only daughter, then hurried to get the wedding ceremony over with the last the widow should change her mind. He spent 30,000 nyang, a lot of money in those days, on the wedding and arranged to send his son's mother-in-law a monthly allowance of 2,500 nyang, supposedly in exchange for her continuing to do all her daughter's sewing and laundry. The bride's family had been moderately well off till her father's death, and since she had been brought up with great care, she was well educated, having been taught all that could be learned in an old-fashioned household and having read all that was proper for a bride. There was no hint of any dark shadow to be seen in her person or manners. As soon as the bride moved in, people began to find fault with the bridegroom. Compared with this bride, he's a crow next to a peacock. Still has no self-control. He'll pay second fiddle to his wife. She deserves better than a bridegroom like him. There were the kinds of things that gossip-mongering wives said when they gathered together. One woman who liked to poke her nose into other people's business even stopped the son once and said, as if reprimanding him, Well, you should know better now that you're an adult. How can you keep a wife and still behave like you do? Aren't you ashamed of entering her room? On such occasions, the son's heart would become filled with animosity toward the speaker. 
Thinking that they were deliberately trying to humiliate him, he had declined to greet or even address them the next time their paths crossed. You're an adult now. You're an old enough to know better by now. Aren't you ashamed in front of your wife? His aunt scolded him like this whenever she dropped in. But instead of feeling ashamed at such reproaches, the nephew grew more resentful of his wife for having placed him in such an awkward position. What's the wife good for? All this trouble started after that wench came. A few days after the wedding, he stopped visiting his wife's room. The household was turned upside down as a result. The family even tried to push him into the bridal chamber as if they were breeding a pig or a horse, but to no avail. Every time such a circus occurred, the newlywed husband picked up whatever he could lay his hands on and swung it around indiscriminately. Once he hit his maternal cousin in the forehead, cutting her badly, the family at a loss about what to do handed the matter over to the father, but there was no use either and caused only more turmoil. Upon being dismissed after a long sermon from his father, the son went to his wife's room and, without warning, grabbed her hair and threw her out into the corridor. You bitch, go back to your home, he yelled. I don't even want to look at you. Don't ever show up here again. If a meal was served, the table would end up somersaulting in the middle of the yard and if new clothes were brought in, they'd be dumped into a trash bin. And so from the time of the wedding onward, the bride cried day and night over her misfortune. She was beaten for the wickedness of her whipping and struck for the dim wittedness of her silence. Not a day of peace passed in the house. Among those who witnessed her daily misery, one person in particular was filled with dark forebodings, namely Samnyong the Mute. He could not understand for all the world how anyone could beat such an angelic woman, someone so beautiful, so affectionate, and so modest that he himself would never have dared to lay a finger on. It made no sense to abuse a lady so pleasing to the eye and too scared to ever be touched. As for himself, he deserved nothing more than to be threshed like a dog or a pig by the young master. Yet it appalled him to no end to watch his mistress, who was as far above him as an angel over a beast, receive the same blows. The mute even worried that his young master would incur divine retribution. On one moonlit night, when all was silent and forlorn, stars flickering here and there, the half-moon hanging lucid in the air, and the world as crystal clear, as if purified with mercury, Samyong lay stretched out on a straw mattress, lost in thought, his hand stroking the back of Blackie the dog, and his eyes gazing up at the sky. When he thought of his new mistress, images of the moon and stars came to mind. Yet, she seemed more graceful than the moon and pure than the stars. She had a heart more beautiful and tender than the silvery moonlight, which washed everything clean. It was as if she were the moon or the star come down to earth or as if she could metamorphose into the moon or a star by merely reaching up to the sky. Samyong recalled how her eyes glistened with pity whenever the young master beat him, though she did not dare speak out. Petting Blake's soft fur with his hand, Samyong felt the warmth fill his heart. The dog licked his hand and wagged its tail, innocently believing that the mute's gentle caresses were meant for it alone. Samyong's heart was filled with compassion for his mistress and with the resolve that he would gladly give his life for her. These sentiments arose as instinctively within him as water fills the mouth of a hungry man at the scent of food. 
Since the arrival of the new mistress, the inner quarters of the house had become off limits to the servants. But the mute could come and go freely, untroubled by the suspicions of others, just as a dog goes in and out of the house as it pleases. One day, Sam Yong found his young master prostrate on the street, utterly drunk. A new habit with him. He had been badly bitten by some brute. Sam Yong carried his young master home on his back. When he brought him inside, he found his mistress sewing alone in her room. She felt grateful to the mute. A little while later, she presented him with a silken pouch to store his flint as a token of her gratitude. The young master noticed the pouch one night. He dragged his wife from her bed and threw her out into the inner yard. Her hair completely disheveled. Then he beat her black and blue. On seeing this, the mute became inflamed with indignation. He rushed in like a wild boar, pulled the young master away, and flung his mistress over his shoulder. Then he ran like a deer to his aging master and laid her down before him. The mute explained his case with repeated hand signs and other gestures. The next morning, the young master struck the mute hard in the face with an ash tree whip. One side of his face bled, his eye and cheek swelling up as large as a fist. "Damn mute! How dare you touch my wife!" cursed the young master as he whipped the mute. Then he grabbed the mute's pouch, tore it off, and threw away its pieces into the privy hole. Bastard! Now he even hits his own master. That bastard deserves to die. He lashed the whip at the nape of the mute's neck, causing him to fall to the ground. The mute joined his hands, pleading for forgiveness. Instead of apologizing with words, he made one deep bow after another, his nose almost touching the ground. But in his heart, a desire for justice was beginning to stir. In his pain, he suppressed a seething anger. From then on, the mute was forbidden to enter the inner quarters. The prohibition aroused his curiosity, which imperceptibly transformed more and more into longing to see his mistress. The longer he went without seeing her, the stronger the flame in his heart burned. He ached with sorrow, yet the desire to see her, even just once, also awakened a new sensibility in his soul. This nameless sensation, despite all his grief, brought him such joy that it made him feel alive. He would have gladly changed his life for this sensation. At times, he wanted to break through the wall of the house with his head, just to see his mistress. But, but he kept such impulses in check. Since this awakening, he ceased to eat well, nor could he concentrate on his work. During breaks, he dreamed of entering the inner quarters. The old master now took better care of him, giving him more food, and tried to make his life a little more comfortable. But the mute was not content. At night, sleepless, he would wander around the walls of the house. One day, after the young master came home drunk again, the house was thrown into a commotion. A servant girl ran for medicine. The mute seized her on her way back in the hope of finding out what was going on inside. The girl touched the back of her head with a closed fist, gently let her hand slide down her face, and then held out an index finger. According to the conventions worked out between the servants and the mute, a thumb meant the old master, an index finger the young master. A fist on the back of the head, the wife, and rubbing the face, caressing. Then the servant girl stuck out her tongue, rolled back her eyes, spread her arms wide, and fell backward. The gesture meant that a person was dying or seriously ill. The mute watched the girl, wide-eyed, took a few steps closer to her, then stood still, stunned. His heart beat rapidly. Did this mean that 
his beloved mistress was dead, he clapped his hands together and let out a deep sigh. Then he went to his room and sat there for hours, motionless as if deep in thought. He became restless as the night grew dark. He would alternately stand up and sit down, and at about two o'clock he finally went out, heading toward the back of the house. Like a thief, he stole up to the wall beneath the back window of his mistress's room. After hesitating a moment, he jumped over the wall. He peered into the room through a gap between its two windows. Then, with a shudder, he stepped back. In the dark, his hands and feet trembled like the leaves of the persimmon tree close behind him. Suddenly, he rushed into the room, kicking the door open. The next moment, the mistress was struggling in his arms. Clutching a long silken towel in one hand and shoving his chest with the other, the mute, wide-eyed uttered "oh, oh, oh," all the while trying to pull the towel away. By now, the house was in an uproar. The family's done for. Of all men, why the mute? Things like that—they're hard to fathom. Such whispers could be heard from one corner of the house to the other. The next morning, the mute lay groaning in the yard, his prostrate body aching all over, blood dripping from his mouth. The young master, interrogating him, stood with an iron-chained club in his hand. Bastard! The young master pointed at his wife's room, making all kinds of obscene gestures. But the mute only waved his hands. Before long, the club was covered with pieces of flesh, and blood flowed. The mute, his throat burning, was unable to utter a sound and just shook his head. He fell and vomited blood, but continued to bow his head, scraping his forehead against the ground. The soil was soaked with his blood. The young master tied the piece of lead to the end of a whip, swung it at the mute's chest, and pulled it back with all his might. The mute fell in silence. The young master was still not content. He ran for a sickle, the blade of which the mute himself had recently sharpened. He raised the sickle high. When the blade was about to strike, the mute grabbed the handle with one hand. Others rushed from inside the house to stop the young master. The mute wrenched the sickle from his young master's hand and threw it away. The old master took to his bed, mourning the fall of his house. He kept the door of his room closed and pretended not to see or hear anything. The family debated whether or not to cast the mistress out. That evening, the mute was dragged out again. The young master gave him his clothes and shoes. Go, he barked. You're not welcome in my house anymore. He glared at the mute and pointed into the distance with his finger. The mute was incredulous. There was nowhere else for him to go, no place to live. He had always believed that he would live and die in this house. He clasped his young master's legs and begged, using gestures and facial expressions. He articulated a sincere and voiceless plea. But the young master kicked him aside and gave an order: "Throw the bastard out!" The mute was hauled out like a dead dog and thrown headfirst into a ditch. After struggling a while to get back onto his feet, he returned to the house. Only to find that the gate had already been bolted shut, he pounded on the gate. In his heart, he was calling out to his old master, but his voice remained silent. The gate, which he used to open and close each day, now banished him. It would not open for him, no matter how much he pleaded. All that he had managed and cared for was now turning against him. The reward for years of faithful service from his childhood till now, during which he had exerted all his body and soul, was eviction.
In the end, he concluded that everyone he had trusted and relied on was his enemy. He had better get rid of them all, including himself. In the night air, the only sounds that could be heard were the crows of a rooster and the dogs barking. A flame certainly flared up around the Sir O's house, once the mute's home. The fire, as if by design, spread along the grass and encircled the walls. Seen from above, the bright flame would have cast an arabesque of the house. Fire, like a demon's tongue, as it savors a morsel of raw flesh, engulfed the entire house in no time. Into this fire, a man braved his way. The man was none other than Sam Nyong, who had been driven from the same house earlier that day. He first went to his old master's room, broke open the door, carried the master out on his back, and laid him on the grass outside. Then he went back again, not heeding the burnt, charring flesh on his face, back, and legs. The mute rushed into his mistress's room, but she wasn't there. He ran to the inner room, but she wasn't there either. Instead, he met his young master, who clutched at his arm and begged for his life, but the mute shoved him aside. P Parts of the rafter, now in flames, fell upon the mute's head, but he barely noticed. He went to the kitchen. On his way out, a doorpost fell and broke his arm, but he didn't pay attention to that either. He headed for the storage room. Even there, he couldn't find her. He returned to her room. Only then did he see her. He found her lying under a quilt, wishing for death. He gathered her up in his arms and looked for a way out, but there wasn't any to be found. Left with no other option, he climbed out onto the roof. He realized that he could no longer move his body freely. Yet he also felt a sense of delight in his heart, unlike anything he had ever known. As he clutched his mistress to his chest, he felt fully alive for the first time. When he sensed that his end was drawing near, he embraced his mistress tightly and then bore his way out through the fire. He put her down outside, his own life already slipping away. The whole house had burned down, and the mute lay in his mistress's lap. Had his indignation died out with the fire? A happy, peaceful smile formed faintly on his lips.